Awesome. Looks like we are live. All right. We have got a great topic that I've been dying to talk about. May go a little long. Uh, I got uh, lots of extra rest yesterday. So all that self-care, all that rest. And today I feel amazing. So uh, I've been doing lots of stuff. And um, of course, my mind just goes with all of these thoughts and trying to narrow it down to one thing. Thanks, I Abby. I appreciate you. So excited to hear. Best mom ever is in Alberta, Canada. Nice. I love my West Coast people. This is not too late for them. <laughs> all right. So tonight's topic is um, power dynamics and control tactics that abusers use. Okay, and for those of you that are first joining me, my name is Tina. I am a happiness coach. Um, I'm trauma informed. I share my personal experience, strength and hope with you in order for you to be able to understand and be able to start to implement this in your life. If you take the ACEs test, which is adverse childhood experiences, you can just Google it, ACEs test. Um, I get a 10 out of 10 on that score, okay? It's not a test that you want to get perfect on, but I'm an overachiever, so I got perfect on that one. But that being said, what I want you to know is despite the trauma that you might have gone through, and although I've done extensive therapy, there were a lot of other things that helped me along the way, and I am here to share those experiences with you guys so that you can start to take that because I still struggle with depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts. They come up randomly sometimes. And being able to get past those things and move yourself into a happier place and be able to utilize these tools um, is really important. At being able to make sure that you are at your best self. And how this also translate is through my logistics career, um, I also did a lot of change management. And some of those theories overlap. Now, change management, for those of you who don't know, is the people side of change. And there's nothing more that you have to change than if you've been through an abusive situation, if you've been through a toxic situation, whether that's a relationship, whether you grew up in one, whether that's a toxic work environment. There is inner work that needs to be done, understanding how trauma works, how it affects us, and the different tactics to be aware of so that you don't become somebody who is victimized by trauma. And there's a big difference between being a victim and having a victim mentality. Now, if you don't heal this trauma, if you don't do the inner work, then what usually ends up happening is we start to live out these particular situations. And we start creating these patterns over and over again. And we start uh, looking for confirmation bias, right? Um, so the topic tonight Sanjay, I see that you say that you're sad here. I'm sorry that you're feeling sad. If you want to give me some more uh, information or if you want to ask a specific question, I'd be more than happy to address it on the live. And while I'm waiting for you to add more information, I'm going to continue on with the training and hopefully I'll see your question come up. Okay. Um, so power dynamics and control. So one of the most fundamental things that all human beings want is a sense of control, AKA freedom, okay? We all want that. Even studies, there have been studies done that infants in a crib um, prefer toys that respond to their movements. Meaning to the baby, it feels like the baby has some sort of control over the toy by when it moves, so does the toy. So even as infants, we prefer having control, having control over our lives 
and um, being able to do that. Occasionally, I'm going to look down at my notes, so forgive me if I'm not <laughs> looking up at the screen. It's because I want to make sure that I'm covering some of the things that I wanted to talk about. So when I looked up the dictionary definition, uh, my husband says, uh, will say he's not going to do a task to try and control. To try and control himself or he's feeling controlled, if you can clarify that a little bit best, Mom. Okay. So freedom is the power to act, speak as one wants without hindrance or restraint. Okay. So a lot of times if people feel like they are being controlled, they will rebel against something, even if it's something that they want, they want the desired outcome, but if they are feeling controlled in the process, they feel like their freedom is being limited, then they will not buy into it. Um, and this is something that is required when you are doing change management, is making sure that the people are buying into the new system, the new process, the new culture, whatever it is that you are trying to change in the business, okay? And this also goes into power dynamics within an abusive situation, okay? Because the opposite of freedom is subjugation. And that is the action of bringing someone or something under domination or control or enslavement. And so that is the complete opposite of freedom, right? So freedom, in essence, is having control over ourselves, having the power to act and speak um, as one wants without hindrance or restraint best mom ever control me he's he will say something like i'm not going to get the groceries anymore then okay um i don't like going for groceries so then he will threaten to stop going okay um and so what happens if he stops going for groceries do you have the ability to get the groceries or are you dependent on him to get the groceries? Okay. So here are five things that abusive people will use. And these are things that I have witnessed in several situations throughout my life. Um, the main abuser that I went through sexual abuse with uh, he was definitely would be classified as a malignant narcissist. Um, not that there was any diagnosis, but the behaviors, I've experienced all of them, and they were quite violent and as well as sexual abuse. And so um, the things, it was, it was one thing to get the therapy for the sexual abuse that I went through, but the second time around is understanding the mind games that were played, and it's those mind games that set me up. So even if the sexual abuse hadn't occurred, there were all these other dynamics that occurred that were actually much more damaging that just allowed the, the sexual abuse to happen, right? Um, I don't like going for groceries, so he will threaten to stop going. Uh, I feel like I don't make sense. I'll just listen to you. Yeah, it, it's hard to, to go through this stuff on um, a chat here, but if you want, uh, Best Mom, what you can do is send me a direct message, and I'll send you a link, and what we could do is book a coffee chat time if you feel like you want to talk more, okay? Um, so, number one is they will criticize and discourage anything that you're dreaming of, anything that you enjoy, anything that brings you happiness or pleasure. They will criticize it, they will mock it, they will disregard it, they will put it down, all of those kind of things 
They'll discourage you from going after those dreams. They'll make fun of you for having those dreams. They'll tell you they're, you're not good enough. All of those kind of things. So number one is that's one of the things that they will do. They will try to shut that stuff down by belittling it, uh, demeaning you, criticizing you, making you feel insecure for even wanting those things uh, in the first place. And so I want to talk, obviously that is easier to see in a personal relationship. Um, maybe a partner is controlling and you want to try a new hobby and they belittle it or they don't want you going out and doing line dancing because now you're going to be with other people and they feel threatened by it. So they're going to try and bring you down and belittle and take that control back, right? So reducing your freedom and um, causing you to feel like you shouldn't do that, right? You shouldn't want those things. And that was something that I went through quite a bit is that every time that um, my abuser saw me happy with something, he would try to take it away. He would do different things. He would pick at me. They would make fun of me, criticize me. And if that didn't work, then he would get the rest of the family to do the same thing and pick on me and make fun of me for certain things, especially if I was being difficult with him and refusing his requests in the evening. And so he would have these uh, critical attacks on me. And so one of the ways that I learned how to cope with that was to learn to not want for anything that I wouldn't allow myself to dream. And I think this is something that's fairly common for most people that have gone through, uh, are dealing with complex C uh, PTSD, um, that you've been through a lot of childhood trauma. You learn not to dream. It's like, why bother? I'm just going to be disappointed anyway. Nothing ever works out for me. And that's where some people from the outside would look at that and say, oh, you've got a victim mindset. And it's like, no, you've been victimized. You haven't healed. There's a difference. Okay, victim mindset to me is somebody who hasn't actually been victimized and they are limiting themselves by the way that they're thinking and that almost always is not the case. It's usually some undealt with trauma that is holding you back and when you actually do the work to dig into where this started and understanding where it comes from that you're able to break the chain so that you can move forward. The second thing an abuser will do is they will increase your fear levels. They will try to make you feel uncertain. They will make you feel like you're doubting, that you shouldn't think the way that you are thinking. Um, you didn't say things right. So you feel like everything that you do is wrong and it makes you have this walking on eggshells. It's like, well, uh, and it causes you to want to constantly check in with other people to see if you are on the right track so that you don't get in trouble. Um, and yeah, I took my son out to pick up garbage for Earth Day and he made it seem like it was a dumb idea. Yeah, I'm sorry, best mom ever. I'm really sorry that that occurred. And understanding now just because somebody is doing these things doesn't automatically mean they're an abuser you have to take everything into context but what I want you to focus on is mainly how does it actually make you feel and if you try to set a boundary do those boundaries get walked all over okay so paying attention to those kind of things is important because um, it matters how you feel. It matters what you think. Um, and always, always, because I don't know your situation, take what you like from what I'm saying and leave the rest. Please keep your safety in mind above all else, okay? 
um, because I know when we were living with that abuser, he was extremely violent and to cross him meant the guns came out, okay? Um, and violence would incur. Um, so please be careful if you are in that kind of situation where um, please honor whatever coping mechanisms you're using to survive. Please know that you don't have to stay in that. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm so happy to hear that best mom ever. Um, so understanding that these are some of the signs that you may want to watch for and more so understanding of not only, okay, if these are happening in an adult situation where it is like maybe your partner or spouse and you love them and they are there for you majority of the time, but sometimes they do annoying things that's bothering you, or maybe it's a work environment where this is this kind of stuff is happening. Um, does your boss always increase the fear and make you feel like you're doing the project wrong or you can never do anything right or um, they don't give you all the instructions so no matter what you do you bring it back to them and then they point out other things that they never communicated to you they never told you and now you just have this feeling of fear of you're never going to get it right never going to get it right and if those kind of things are happening, a lot of times those 20% is what's going on today and 80% is going on from the past. Um, I have no idea what that is, <laughs> daddy long legs. Um, and I'm not sure if that's appropriate for this um, conversation. Okay. So increasing the fear is the second thing. So if you find that you're constantly feeling more and more afraid, that you're uncertain of if what you're doing is right, whether or not, and you just kind of get this feeling where you shouldn't speak up, you shouldn't say anything, and you should just be quiet, then the abuser is actually been able to get you under control, remove your freedom by silencing your voice where it's just easier to stay quiet. Now, sometimes you can do this in a healthy relationship if you haven't healed from the trauma that you maybe have experienced in the past. If you haven't analyzed this stuff, you haven't done the inner work to understand where this is coming from, then you may repeat this even if you are in healthier situations. Um, I've seen this, I've experienced this, that after I started to do the healing work um, and I had some coworkers that were trying to get me to behave in ways that I would have in the past and I was like wait a minute I I know what you're doing and I have no intention of being your bully but it was funny because I would actually see that person when I didn't react the way that they wanted they wanted somebody to pick on them and that would confirm their belief system and when I refused and I actually remained supportive of the person, they found somebody else to go pick on them and bully them. And I was like, wow, this is really fascinating that this is what will happen to you if you don't actually do this inner work, right? Um, the third thing that'll happen with an abuser is that they will blame you for failure their failures, your failures, they're going to blame you for everything. Even if you weren't around, maybe you didn't tell them something. Maybe you didn't park in the right spot. Maybe you did a bunch of other things that they think is your fault, that they don't want to take responsibility. They project everything onto you. This is also important because when you start to do that in our work, you will also start to take ownership of everything that you are doing because I don't know about you, but the last thing I want is to be viewed as an abuser. So I kind of go the opposite direction and I'm like, I take responsibility. It's like, okay, yep, you know what? I did do that. You know what? I am going to correct that. You know what? 
And that is complete opposite of what somebody who is in that abusive cycle. Now, if somebody is in that abusive cycle, they are in a state of fear and they are acting out their wounds. So fear is false evidence appearing real. Um, and yeah, best mom ever. I'm going to start therapy soon. 40 year old diagnosed with ADHD last summer, anxiety also. Yeah, well, that's great. I'm really glad to hear that you're going for therapy. That was so helpful for me. Um, when I actually went through therapy and being able to have additional outside supportive uh, groups and um, uh, friends that were also on the same path as me of this healing journey, this discovery is really important, right? And yeah, and you know what? I believe that even if somebody is in that abusive cycle, it's just the flip side of of it is the flip side of their their own abuse okay um, and when you actually see this because the funny thing is is when I was a child I could also see this before I had even had any therapy but I used to negotiate between my mom and her boyfriend who was the abuser um, and I could see both sides of where they were coming from and where they had miscommunication issues um, so best mom ever is uh, let's see I feel like I haven't had a lot of trauma in my life but my hubby doesn't help things sometimes he's good to me but controlling at times yeah and one of the things that you have to remember is that when people are controlling they're in a state of fear and that's how they learn to cope with their situations of to stay in that kind of control so that they, um, because that feeling of powerlessness is that loss of freedom and that need for control is something that allows people to feel safe, right? So, and that is that sense of freedom, that power to act and speak as one wants without hindrance or restraint. And sometimes people will see that if you don't allow them to have that kind of control, they see that as you lack trust in them. And then they can kind of get defensive about those kind of things too. Um, thank you so much. I followed you to keep up with you. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you followed. Um, and guys, if you are jumping in and out, uh, you can always catch the replays. I do upload those on YouTube under my channel, Coach Tina B125. Uh, he's an only child, had a good childhood. Um, I just have to figure me and him out. Yeah, and you know what? People can feel like they have a good childhood. So, um, it wasn't until I started to dig a little bit deeper when I started to wanting to coach um, on this subject that I realized I'm like, oh shoot, there's all these other things that I wasn't aware of that I'm like, okay, that makes more sense now of why I behave that way and why my brother behaves this way and why my mom behaves this way. And I just understood some family dynamics a little bit better. And that can go a long way for being able to heal relationships. However, keep in mind that you can only do your side. You only can do uh, your inner work. And it's by you doing the inner work for yourself that other people around you will start to see that positive change. So don't give up on it. Stick with it. Don't try to change them. Don't try to drag them and force them to heal as well. When you just focus on yourself as a natural byproduct of you becoming happier with yourself, then others around you will naturally start to want to know. At first, they're going to try and get you to change back because they don't know what's going on. And if you don't communicate the changes correctly, um, and if you go check out my YouTube channel, the self-care video that I did yesterday, the what why, who, and how uh, talks about this particular situation of how to actually communicate when you're making changes because um, 
people find change very threatening, especially if it's not one that they initiated. So your husband may feel like you going to therapy is a way for you to start bitching and complaining and making him out to be the bad guy. It may bring up a bunch of insecurities and fears, and that could cause him to react negatively. And please forgive my cat in the background. Katie, please. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, and that's great. Yeah, oh, you have kids four and seven feeling lost. Yeah, this is going to help you um, definitely. It's going to help both of you. It's going to help you. It's going to help your kids, and it will help your family. So um, I'm really happy that you're going to be going to therapy. You getting stronger and finding that best version of you is only going to bring more happiness, okay? Um, so... Uh, number three way that abusers will try to control, Katie, come here, come here, come on, come on, good girl, <laughs> sorry guys, um, he doesn't believe I have ADHD also, he doesn't believe it or use it or I use it as an excuse. And that is from lack of understanding. Um, and I would ask more questions around why he feels that particular way, right? Um, because there, it may be just understanding and clarifying a little bit better. Now, you have to do that without taking it personally. So if you're not able to detach, I wouldn't recommend asking questions and you just finding out for you and not worrying about how he's feeling about it. Let him deal with his own feelings. Uh, your daughter was diagnosed also. Yeah, and keep in mind that a lot of times the symptoms of abuse and um, ADHD, they overlap. Uh, now there are some... Uh, subtle differences that um, will determine whether it's uh, complex PTSD or ADHD, but I find a lot of people that have ADHD have also had trauma of some sort, okay? Um, so whatever it is, I'm sure as you go through therapy, you're going to find out more. I'm not a therapist. I am trauma-informed. Um, but I speak a lot from my own personal experience, okay? Thank you for liking the live, by the way. Um, so, number three is blamed for your failures. So, whether that's their failures, failures of your kids, failures of your partners, failures of your family, um, there's all kinds of things that they will blame you for. And Keep in mind that if somebody is blaming, okay, even if this is ourselves, uh, one little thing that I always learn to do is think of it as like when you're pointing the finger, it's like, it's your fault, blah, blah, blah. Well, there's three fingers that are pointing back at you, which means that you need to look three times as hard at yourself before you're blaming others. Um, and if you limit yourself so that you are only speaking from I statements, not you statements, because as soon as you start using you statements, you did this, it's your fault. If you hadn't have done this, I wouldn't have done that. If you only speak from I statements, then you're taking full responsibility. You talk about your feelings, not their actions. Okay? That because what that does is that assumes some sort of judgment that assumes um, understanding their intent and we can be incorrect about somebody's intent for something and we may be a hundred percent right but I promise you that's probably not going to make you happy by blaming somebody else okay so that's the number three Thing that abusers will use. They will blame you for failures. Theirs, yours, your kids, your family, your co-workers, your boss, all of this kind of stuff. Okay? 
Um, so learning to take responsibility is actually the antidote to that, okay? The number four thing is they're going to deny your suspicion. So if you start catching on to some of the stuff, the discrepancies, maybe lies that they've told, something that doesn't quite add up, you feel something is off and you start to question, now they're going to deny and they're going to pull out the gaslighting tactics, right? That's not what, you're not remembering it right. That's not what I said. You're making a big deal out of nothing. You're so sensitive. I got all of those things. And um, the scary thing is, is if that continues, it's not only the denying the, your suspicions where you're like, wait a minute, I'm starting to catch on to your tricks. So now you start to question them. So they might use ghosting tactics. They might use gaslighting. They might deny or try to blame you or a bunch of different things will start to come out at how they're going to um, take that power back. Because abusers, this isn't about, this is their fear of loss of control, okay? And nobody abuses somebody else if they haven't been abused themselves. It's just how it goes. I don't believe that there's anybody out there that has that is abusive that hasn't been through some sort of abuse. This is how they learned how to cope. A lot of times survivors of abuse, they go one of two ways. They either side with the uh the abuser and they become like the abuser. So if I'm stronger than my dad, then he can't beat me up. Kind of that kind of thought process, right? Um and if I'm more of a dick or if I'm more abusive or aggressive or whatever it is, they find that that kept them safe. That's the path that they're going to go down because that's what actually worked. Now, do people do this consciously? No, they don't. They're just trying to survive a situation, especially if this happened in childhood. There are certain behaviors, certain tactics, and even if they didn't experience that trauma, I can promise you there's probably some sort of trauma in their lineage, and maybe their parents improved upon it by, I'm not going to be physically abusive with my children, but maybe all of the mindset and the uh, verbal abuse, uh, then emotional neglect, all of those kind of things are still present in the family because those things weren't healed. They just improved upon it by, I'm not going to be violent like my dad was, right? Or I am not going to uh, hit my kids or um, be needy with my kids like my mom was or whatever, like, whatever the situation is. And each generation does try to improve upon the last. And sometimes it's a little bit of a pendulum swing, right? You know, you go from one extreme, my, my dad was too strict to now uh, I'm too lenient, right? So it can kind of go way uh, back and forth. And sometimes we visit balance as we're swinging by, right? Um, so the next thing that will happen with an abuser, if they can't control you with these four things, then they're going to um, actually attack, right? So that could be verbally attacking you. Um, they might become abusive with their language. Um, they may become violent uh, or aggressive. Um, have aggressive intimidating behaviors they might maybe it's not directed at you but maybe they might lash out or like you know slam their fist or slam the doors and uh, punch holes in the wall and stuff like that some sort of physical aggression that is all done to intimidate and to pull that control back to you because if you're afraid then you will relinquish relinquish the control and for the abuser, you have to remember they're in a state of fear. This is their attempt to gain control again because they fear, fear the loss of the control. So this isn't just to paint out the bad guy, the, you know, they're a narcissist, they're a monster, you know. No, they're a human being. They've, um, they have 
I, um, come on, Tina, spit it out. <laughs> they have acquired maladaptive coping strategies. They've worked for them, but they don't understand that they're abusive. They still think it's lesser of two evils because for them, if they are in control, then they are safe. So they don't feel safe and they usually can't come out and say, I don't feel safe, right? They weren't taught those kind of strategies. They weren't taught like I'm afraid, right? And especially men, they're taught that the only emotion that they really are allowed to express is anger, right? Their frustration, they're allowed to express that. But a guy's not allowed to cry and say, I'm afraid, I have no friggin' idea what I'm doing here, right? They have to be seen as the strong one, right? Because if not, it they can be overpowered, especially if they've been through abuse, right? Um, my hubby, my hubby will break things when he's mad. I feel like I just got used to it over the years, and I laugh, right? Um, it only happens once a year or less. I think that he wasn't allowed to express that. Yeah, and not being allowed to express the anger and if you have to um, take it, take it, take it, what will happen is as you continue to deny your feelings, it's like racking up an emotional credit card and eventually that bill will come due and they'll explode. It's like a pressure cooker. We've all done this. It's like, and think of the different things that will reduce your tolerance to it. Um, I talked about this in one of my other videos is hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or sick. If you're one of those five things, stop whatever you're doing. You're not going to respond as your best self. Go take care of those things first and then come back and address whatever the issue is, right? Um, and best mom ever, as you go through therapy, as you start to do this inner work, you're going to become much more aware of these kind of things. And one of the things that you can do is when you start to recognize certain patterns and because you'll be given a safe place in therapy, you can start to offer that safe place to him because you're going to start to recognize the signs. You're going to start to recognize the stuff within yourself um, and you can start to learn how to diffuse his fear and what's coming up for him. You're going to see it in a completely different light, okay? Because there's fear and there's love. Fear is false evidence appearing real. Love is the only thing that's real. And um, that is something that's important. Now, always protect yourself. This doesn't mean get walked on, any of those kind of things. But um, these are the five things that abusers will do. They're going to criticize and discourage and belittle the things that you like or dream about or have fun with, your happiness. They're going to take that away. Um, they're going to increase your fear. They're going to blame you for failures. They're going to, um, when you start to catch on to what's going on, you start to confront it, they're going to deny your suspicions. They're going to gaslight. And then they're going to throw rocks at you or attack you. Um, and they're going to make you out to be the enemy, right? Um, and so understanding when you're recognizing some of those patterns, um, you know, okay, I feel like I'm scared going therapy I'm going to go with the flow and try to keep light but I have to be strong yeah and just take it a day at a time as you go through therapy um, I know I had to build up a trust level before I truly opened up in fact I was extremely resistant to going to therapy in the beginning I fought it. <laughs> I wanted to go and prove that I was fine, that there was nothing wrong with me. I was okay. There was nothing wrong. And so, um, but then I ended up crying before the end of the session. So I felt like I had to go back and prove that I was fine. <laughs> so, but then I also ended up doing this like little pattern where I'd kind of uh, I'd be late, I, I wouldn't make it there on time, so I'd cancel like two other therapy sessions. But then I'd feel guilty because I had canceled a couple, 
and then I would go to the next session and I'd make up all these excuses and all this kind of stuff. I wasn't aware. I that's just where I was at. And um I had no clue of any of these patterns or any of these things and um, after a couple of times, like my therapist, she didn't confront it the first time. She let it slide. And then after a couple of times, um, she's like, I know, Tina, you were just building up trust. And that was just such a different way of looking at it. Of like, And when she said that, it was like a penny drop. It's like a puzzle piece fell into place that I was like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that I do this in so many other places in my life. And when I started, when I recognized that pattern, it was like an aha moment, this like angel singing. And it's like, oh my God, I do do that. I do find ways, like I would cancel with friends. And it wasn't because I didn't want to go. It's because I did, I had so much shame and so much fear inside of me that the only way I knew how to cope with it was to cancel those plans because I didn't know how to deal with those emotions. So I'm really excited for you, best mom ever, that you're going to go to therapy. Um, this it is going to be something that is going to be really beneficial for you. Um, and take that time to build the trust with your therapist to be able to open up in a space that you feel comfortable with. And um, the more honest that you can be, the more that you can truly open up, the better. Of course, not every therapist. I really lucked out. I really lucked out. I was so blessed to get the therapist that I did get. Um, and and I had her for almost 10 years. And I that was such a, such a blessing. And the bonus is, is because I started it, what, it happened to be with a free program that I was able to go. Now I had to drive like half hour, 45 minutes to get there, but it was free. I had that therapy for free and that's why I am like so grateful, but it was because, and it was, it's funny. It was the thing that I resisted the most is because I didn't want to go because the place was called the youth clinic and I saw myself as an adult. I was 19, don't you know? <laughs> and I really didn't want to go because I didn't want to be considered um, a youth. I didn't want to be considered a child. I didn't want anything to do with childhood. Wonder freaking why. <laughs> but I was fine. There was nothing wrong with me. My childhood didn't affect me. I just survived it. I got through it. And as long as I could put it in the past, I thought I was fine. I wasn't so fine. And I thought as long as I, I had a good job, I got paid good money, I got good grades, I had a boyfriend, I was smart, I was intelligent, all of this kind of stuff. So it's like, I didn't have a drinking problem. I didn't have a drug problem. There was nothing wrong with me. I was good. <laughs> Until it wasn't. <laughs> and so doing the inner work has been the single most rewarding thing that I have ever done in my life. It has helped me in so many ways. It has helped me in my career. It has helped me in business. It has helped me with my relationships. It has helped me in so many ways. It is the best thing that you could possibly do. And I honestly think that everybody should do this. And this is why I do this for free, because I think this world can be an amazing place if all of us learn to deal with our emotions in this way. And even if you haven't been through trauma, I can promise you somebody you work with has been through trauma and they haven't healed it and it will affect your business. I can promise you that. There are so many dynamics. It's because of the therapy I've done, I've been able to diffuse and mitigate and negotiate better um, in every aspect of business. 
And because I was aware of how to deal with this stuff and I could recognize the signs, it's like I could see right through them. It's like, oh, I know what's going on here. Okay, I know how to deal with this. I know how to reduce the fear. I know how to bring comfort and trust to them. And I know how to um, encourage that, yes, they are going to be able to get the results that they're looking for. And all of these things and really understanding this and reversing the stuff because the only reason that they are being mistrustful, especially in business, is because they've been through a previous experience, whether that was childhood or another toxic work environment, maybe just a bad boss, I don't know. It doesn't matter where the abuse came from. I just know I can recognize when somebody has been through abuse and how to help them through that. And this is what I do with my coaching program is I help business owners um, because, and I do the free training daily. So I'm on here daily, please. If you enjoy this, come back again tomorrow. Check out my YouTube channel, Coach Tina B125. I have lots of other trainings there. I think I've got like 98 videos uploaded. So I'm almost at the 100 mark. So I'm, that's pretty cool considering I just started at the end of December, right? So um yeah started doing these lives i've been doing this kind of stuff in the background one-on-one -on -one with people and the thing is is as good as i am at being able to talk and run my mouth off here for almost an hour both trainings is i'm a much better listener and being able to understand and hear what it is that you go through um, and the reason why I want to work with business owners is because we spend so much time, whether you're an entrepreneur, I can promise you, you spend more than 40 hours a week if you're an entrepreneur. And if you're not an entrepreneur um, or a business owner, then you're in a nine to five and this is going to be able to help you in your business to be able to grow and your people spend so much time. You can have such a great impact on the world by encouraging your team to do the inner work because you yourself as a business owner has done the inner work and you can prevent old business strategies that are not effective because as people become more self-aware, they actually care for themselves. They actually respect themselves. They actually have love for themselves. They are not going to put up with abusive old practices that used to work um, that would, you know, bosses that would discourage your dreams. I've had bosses tell me that, well, there's no place that you can actually grow within the company. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? This is the biggest company in this industry. And you're telling me there's no place for me to grow? Are you insane? I had that told to me one time. And I was like, that was enough to get somebody who was a really devoted, loyal employee to say, fuck this shit, I'm out, bye, later, and I left. And, you know, when they do things to increase fear, it, as a leader, the last thing you want to do is have your team afraid. They're not going to think clearly. They're not going to make good, good decisions. They're not going to think creatively on how to solve problems. They're going to be contracted. They're only going to do what you tell them to do. You're always going to have to be there to crack the whip on them. And it is not an effective way to run a business or an operation. And, um, and then they're going to blame other people for the failures. They're not going to take responsibility. I didn't get this done because Joe didn't give me the report. He didn't do the thing, da, 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 whatever. And you're going to have to constantly feel like you're babysitting your team. And it's just going to take so much time and energy. And you're like, this isn't that hard. You know the shit I had to go through to build the business to this level that you even have a team. Okay, and to you, you might be frustrated because you're like, why can't I get good help? Why can't people, like, you know, people just don't want to work anymore. They seem entitled, blah, 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 blah. And you feel like you're alone in this forest of trying to deal with people. And they will never care about your business as much as you do. I can promise you that. But 
if you change the way that you operate, you create an environment that actually makes them happier than any other place that they have ever been before. I can promise you, you are going to get the best out of them. I'm glad you got good tips out of this tonight. Best mom ever. Please come back again uh, and keep us posted on your journey with therapy. I'm really excited for you. So thank you so much for asking questions and sharing tonight. I really appreciate the interaction. So thank you. All right. Um, yeah. So you definitely want to make sure that you are helping your team so that they're not, because I can promise you this happens all the time for people in a business. Have you ever caught somebody on your team that you start to question them? I had this one boss. She was awesome at this. If she started asking you questions and other people didn't pick up on this and she would do this not only um, to her team, but she would do this to other teams, like interacting. If she started asking you a bunch of questions, she already knew the answer. She already knew. And she was just checking, are you actually going to tell her the truth or are you going to lie to her? And um, so <laughs> um, if somebody is denying and lying and they're deflecting and they're putting shifting the blame and you catch them in this kind of stuff, then you have some toxicity going on in your team. And I can promise you, if you caught them as the business owner, as the leader, as the manager, whatever it is your role of authority is, and you catch them in this kind of stuff, then I can promise you they're doing way worse behind the scenes to other people. If that's what they're doing to you as the authority, I can promise you the people that are equal to them or lower than them are getting it way worse. And you you have your team that is being suppressed and abused in different tactics. So when you learn to identify these things, when you learn to do that inner work yourself, you can stop this stuff, you can mitigate it before it even happens, and you create a culture where that kind of behavior is not tolerated. And you're going to have people on your team that are happier, that feel safe, that feel loved, that feel open and expressive and creative, and they're going to, they, those kind of people, happy people, when they come into work and they are happy to be there because they feel supported, they feel loved, they feel like, I would never want to leave this team. When you create that kind of loyalty, that kind of environment for people to work in, if you even had a bad couple of months, you know, they would stick it out with you. Even if you had fell on hard times, they would step up to make sure that they gave back to you in ways, and it wouldn't be about monetary compensation, right? Now, please don't take advantage of this, because then that throws you into the category of an abuser. If you are expecting people to work and exploit them without giving them fair compensation, well, you're taking their control, you're taking advantage of them, and that will come back and bite you in the ass if you're doing that. So please don't do that. Um, even if you get away with it, um, because I've been in a work environment where people were promised a bunch of different things. This was a work environment I inherited. It was also a work environment somebody else inherited. They believed stuff that was told to them. Those, after a couple of years, it didn't end up being true. And yes, we got a lot of work out of those people, but we ended up losing them. And we went through a period of high turnover, constant training, a lot of wasted time and um, costs, hidden costs that um, aren't calculated by a KPI. But your, your business ends up bleeding out money because you're spending all of this time trying to train new people, trying to replace the turnover. And just as you get them done, then they realize it's like, nope, and they leave. And you're just like, well, shit. 
Um, and it wasn't until I finally said, I don't even care. <laughs> I'm going to hire somebody. I don't care if they have a bad attitude. If they actually have the skills, I'm going to hire. I stopped trying to hire the A players because we didn't have an A player opportunity. And if you don't have an A player opportunity, don't hire an A player. If you don't have the company that can grow to that level, then don't hire an A player because they're going to catch on to your bullshit and they're going to catch on to your lies and then eventually they're going to leave and maybe you get away with that for a little while and you're like well whatever i had a, an a player for a couple of years so they leave and they go to some other place i at least got them for a couple of years is that really the energy you want to put into your business is that how you want to operate do you not think that that kind of energy is going to come back to you. Think about that. Don't do it. Don't do it. I'm telling you, when you're going through a, a hard time and you're experiencing bad karma or whatever um, because of it, just know that this stuff is happening because of decisions that you made that you thought you could get away with. And that will not play out well for you, okay? So, guys, please be aware of the five things that abusers do and make sure that you're not falling into those categories. Make sure that you're catching yourself. If you're criticizing somebody and you're trying to put down their dreams, their aspirations, their goals, because if you are, ask yourself, why are you so afraid of them growing? Are you afraid that if they start learning these skills, they start doing these other things, that they're going to leave you? Do you have fear of abandonment issues? Because if it's a business and you're afraid that they're going to leave and then you're going to get stuck without somebody, then you haven't put enough work into creating an environment, an opportunity that they would never want to leave, that they would always see growth within the organization for them. And if it got to the point where you couldn't offer them growth, then treat them like they're a beloved family member, that you would want them to grow with another company, even if that meant they weren't growing with you. Because I can promise you that you would still have that goodwill, that good karma with those people that if they still felt supported, even if they left your organization, then they're going to still tell other people to come work for your organization. They're going to refer other friends because they have good friends that they can bring in and Maybe it's not the right fit for them, or maybe they just needed to grow to a new level. So, guys, those are some of the things that I wanted to talk about tonight. Those are the power dynamics and um, the control tactics that abusers use. So if you guys are popping in a little bit late, make sure you check out my YouTube channel, Coach Tina B125. Click the subscribe button so you get notified when I've uploaded the live training. Um, and I always upload the daily live trainings to my YouTube channel. So go back, peruse those, check those out, and come back again tomorrow. Okay? Hope this was helpful. Have a great night, guys, and we'll talk to you later. Bye!